Hey everyone, my name is Matt. Welcome to my shop and welcome back to my series on building this serpentine chest of drawers. Last time we did all the dovetailed case work. This time we're going to change our basic flat front dovetailed case into this, uh, this curvy thing right here. <laughs> Again, I want to say a big thank you to Triton Tools for sponsoring this series and continuing to support the channel over the last several years. Uh, just like last time, we're getting into routers. This time we're going to take a look at the MOF, the two and a quarter horsepower router, the more nimble of the two routers. But for now, let's uh, hop into curvy stuff or something. So it is finally time to get back to this thing, which you made in part one. This is going to give us the entire shape of the front case. So uh, this should be a nice little curvy episode. So before we start getting into it, I'm just going to take a look at the top here and we're going to run through a little bit of the details here as far as what we're going to do with the curvature as well as the bead detail which is going to outline each of the drawer openings. So we bring our template in here we can see how the curve is going to relate to the dividers and then the case sides. So bring this thing in here you can see the case sides are included in the curvature of this uh, curve detail here. So we have this little bit of material here on each end. So what's going to end up happening is the case side is going to be ripped with a bevel on it to roughly approximate the curve as it occurs right here. It doesn't need to be super perfect because we're gonna end up probably blending things together as uh, we do the final assembly. So the other big kind of important detail here is that the curve is actually going to be a little proud on the dividers and all the horizontal pieces versus the sides because we need some material there for the bead. This is gonna be an eighth inch bead which is gonna run around the, uh, the drawer openings. So you can see I have a little bit of extra material up here I originally left that just so I could come in here with the saw and make sure I get right on the curve with the saw versus coming in and trying to cut right to there. You always end up with some kind of weird flat spot, so giving yourself a little bit of extra material to actually come through and cut this curve makes this curve process a little bit, uh, a little bit easier. But all that is just to say that the dividers are going to be a little bit proud, so they'll be kind of forward of the case sides a little bit. The one thing I'm going to do before I forget is this profile here, this curve, probably not perfectly symmetrical because I as a human made it. So it could be a little bit different if I flip it this way. So to keep the whole case consistent, I'm gonna keep this as my reference face, the top. So that's gonna be up. So when I go and do my template routing, I wanna make sure I have the same exact orientation all the way down the case. So now in theory, I should be all set to go ahead and start cutting and template routing all the dividers, all these horizontal pieces, and then ripping the case uh, with the uh, bevels on there. One thing I'll note at this point is the fact that the depth of this case, the final depth, doesn't really matter. So if something crazy happens and things don't work out perfectly, if you end up having to take off a little more material to get yourself some new material and the case ends up a half inch narrower or less deep, it doesn't matter. So I have extra material here. The whole case is a little bit deeper at this point than I need to be in case I don't like this or in case this bead detail fails or whatever. Because one of the other things with the bead detail is the bead is going to be on the top and the bottom of the dividers and I have to clear out all the material between them to expose just like the beads. So it should be, should be fun. So I'm going to start with the dividers because they're the easiest and I have to pull them out of here anyway. So the back edge which is going to be straight for all of this is going to be essentially our reference edge. There'll be a reference edge on all the parts. So I have my little template here, which is obviously narrower than this. And to make the alignment here a little bit easier, I cut this little strip here, which I can stick onto the back here and line it up with the back edge. And now I have my kind of like rotational alignment correct. And all I have to do is worry about my left to right alignment. I have a center line that I could use, but I can also come over here and just verify that I'm protruding the same amount on both ends. And that'll be good enough for now. Again, right now for this first little bit, all I'm doing is a rough material removal. So I'm just going to trace around the template and then roughly cut it out at the bandsaw. When I actually stick this template down to do the flush trimming, that's when the actual proof alignment actually matters. So I'll go ahead and do this first one. I'll get a bandsaw on and then I'll flush trim it to the template. And this will become my new template for the other two dividers. And then once we get through those other two dividers, we can uh, pull the case apart and start working through its curvatures as well.
So the next thing on the to-do list is going to be add the bead detail to the front, uh, I guess, dividers and then the top of the case. So this is the sample I just did. Just to give you an idea of what we're kind of going for, we want the bead on the top and bottom of the, uh, the dividers and then, of course, on the top and bottom of the case, it'll just be on one side for that drawer opening and then the area in between will be cleared out. So you have a little bit of a recess here and then you have your two uh, bead details on either side. So the first bit here is going to be just a beading bit. That's an eighth inch bead, uh, kind of smallish, I don't know, maybe like medium size, something like that, but that's gonna give us that detail there. That's going to leave all this material here in the middle. So if I turn this piece like this, you can see the chunk there in the middle, which has to go bye-bye. Uh, so then I have a second router with a slot cutter. I just happen to have two routers. You could do uh, these sequentially, but I would set this, both of them up at once so I can kind of just verify my setup all in one go. So this has a bearing on it, which gives me a cut depth, which is almost the right depth for this, uh, what the bee is gonna be cutting. So there is a slight little ridge in there, which I can remove by hand later on, but this will at least allow me to clear out the bulk of the waste. The bearing is gonna ride against the bead, and it's gonna allow me to clear out all of this stuff. So I'm gonna do the, uh, well, I'm assuming that the dividers are gonna be the easiest ones to do, because they're just like the sample, but the, uh, the case ones should be a little more interesting because there's a lot more waste that'll have to be removed. Um, so, I don't know, just some simple basic routing. The only, I guess, scary or challenging part about this is that for this bead, the workpiece cannot lift off that router at all. If it does, the bead will be, well, ruined. <laughs> It'll be a different uh, diameter or thickness or whatever. And um, yeah, we'll be starting over again. Once again, though, these dividers are you know wider than they need to be so if i do mess up any of the beads all i have to do is just remove that beaded area flush trim the divider again back to the template and go again so at least there is some kind of fallback here it's not like the end of the world if i screw this up which is which is nice to have that in the back of your mind but i prefer to you know not screw it up and not have to go through and re-prep the uh the divider so I don't know, should be pretty uneventful. And then the, uh, the top and bottom of the case should be you know, very similar. There's gonna be a little more precision or a little more, I don't know, strategy, I guess, with removing all that waste. So yeah, that's about it. <laughs> Just more routing. There's, there's, there's a lot of routing in this project so far. We'll see if there's any more later, maybe. There probably will be. There's probably a lot more to go. <laughs> This is basically a router project. So while I'm doing all that routing, let's continue our discussion on Triton's routers. Last time we talked about the TRA, and this time we're gonna talk about the MOF. And this is the router that I'm using in the video. It's small and compact, but still packs plenty of power. It features dynamic load control, which keeps the bit RPM at a constant velocity throughout any kind of changing conditions. Now, as I mentioned last time, the two routers share a lot of the same features, and last time we talked more about the router table functionality, this time we're gonna talk about the plunge functionality. Triton routers are a dual mode plunge, so in one mode you have the standard plunge mechanism, but in another mode you also have this nice rack and pin plunge, which allows you to raise and lower the router by twisting the knob. This is my favorite feature of these routers, and it gives you a lot more precision and control through the plunge process. Another great feature of that plunge mechanism is that it has built-in detents. So if you're doing an operation where you need to make incremental passes like a mortise, you can step down in roughly quarter inch increments without taking your hand off the handle. So that is Triton's MOF. It's a two and a quarter horsepower router, a smaller version of the TRA, which is a three and a quarter horsepower router. So there are the uh, finished bead details on all the pieces. And from here, we have, uh, I guess, two major things to take care of before we put the case back together. Uh, first off is gonna be to miter all of these beads here on the end, so it's out of the way. And then the other thing will be to actually rip the bevel onto the front of the case, the, the two case sides to match whatever's going on over here. Let's head over to the table saw. Now to get started on mitering this bead here, we got a little bit of prep work to square up the ends of these things and get this extra little bit of waste out of here. 
I'm just gonna make a quick a little saw cut here. Just to get me started. And then I can remove some of that waste on uh, I guess either side of this groove. We don't need this here. Now I'm just gonna continue this shoulder up around here to get the end of the bead. So that's about it for prep. I'm not too worried about this stuff right now because I had to flush this up with the case anyway. I just wanted to make sure I'm down to the very bottom right where the bead is. So next we can start working on the miter itself. So I made this little guide block to help me actually cut these miters with the chisel. I'm only going to cut a miter right at the very end here. I only care about mitering the actual bead. We don't want to be mitering back here because we want the shoulder to be there for the dovetail. So I'm going to just kind of roughly lay this on here. I didn't have a scrap piece wide enough, so I have this little piece of MDF, which will help me figure out the angle side to side. I can make it parallel to the back and then just clamp this little guide in place. And now I'm going to start working this material out of here using the block as a guide for the actual angle. So a little bit of waste here first. I'll probably come back to I don't know, here, go about a half inch back. Something like that. Yeah. I think I'm going to be a little bit conservative right now. I can always trim out for more later when I fit the vertical piece in here. So I think for now, that's probably about as far as I need to take the miring on all of these. So I'm just going to go through and just knock out all of these. So at least we are like one step closer <laughs> uh, to having a mitered bead. We can do all of those final tweaks later once the case is completely glued up. And while I have those dividers pulled out of the case, I'm going to go ahead and cut the mortises in the back. These are going to connect these dividers to the runners, which will support the drawers. So with that, I think the next big thing is going to be to get this thing glued up and kind of ready to go for there. So we have a few little details here and there to take care of before we're ready to do that. So basically the next time I put this back together, it will be with, uh, with glue. So the first thing I'm gonna knock out is to cut the drawer runners, which are gonna go from the front to the back. That's gonna be super easy because those don't need to be very precise either. You wanna cut them a little bit short. That way there is a little bit of an expansion gap in there so that when the case sides expand and contract, there is somewhere for that movement to go. So that takes care of the drawer runners. They're all ready to go in. And there is a little bit of a gap here, so that way if this or when this case side shrinks in the middle of winter, the movement will have somewhere to go because the front and back are fixed in place. They are going to move relative to each other, either in and out. So this is going to give a little bit of space for that movement to go somewhere. We'll have the tenon that's going to join the front of the divider, or front of the runner to the divider. We'll have the that connection fully glued. And this one back here will leave floating so that the tenon can move in and out of the mortise allowing it to be supported for the weight of the drawer, but also move through the seasons. So I think at that point, or at this point, it's just gonna be take it apart and do the last little things. I have the bead on the front of the case to miter, the front top, I guess, of the case that has to get mitered. And then I think lastly, I just have to cut the rabbit in the back for the back panels. And then I guess just with sand the inside stuff real quick, 
And then that's gonna be about it. Time for some uh, some glue up after that. Actually, it's kind of nice. So now is the point in the project when you have to like kind of take a step back and think and make sure you did everything you're going to have to need to do before this thing goes together and can never, ever come apart again. I think, I think I got everything, everything figured out and squared away and I'm good to get to, get, get to gluing up. So everything is kind of laid out. We've got some room to work. Clamps are right there. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's get into this. This is not something you want to forget something about because there's a lot of time has been invested up until this point. <laughs> so for the glue for this, I'm going to be using Total Boat's traditional five to one epoxy resin. And I have the slow hardener here. So epoxy is going to be a really great adhesive for this project for a few different reasons. Uh, the first reason is just the overall working time. I've been using epoxy more and more and pretty much I'm to the point now where if I'm going to do a case glue up or a furniture glue up, I'm just going to be using epoxy with the slow hardener. It's uh, so much less stressful to not have to worry about getting parts together and, you know, if you miss something or whatever and you can't get them apart again because it's been too long. With the slow hardener, you can easily get a good half hour out of just like getting epoxy onto parts and getting things together and probably about 45 minutes to the point where things will still come apart if you you know made a huge mistake and forgot something or another so i personally really enjoy the less stress part of uh the glue up which helps quite a bit another sort of side thing for me is that since i'm recording my glue ups it also gives me a little more time to think about moving the camera around and makes it a little bit easier for me as far as video production goes which is uh always nice so plenty of time to work. That's the, the big reason. Another bonus reason here is that this is not a water-based glue. So as it goes onto the wood, it does not swell the fibers. In a project with some, you know, really well-fitting dovetail joints, that can help quite a bit. And actually, because it's not water-based, it actually lubricates things. And the joints that were kind of hard to put together before become more of a slip fit, which is kind of the kind of a backwards thought compared to traditional water-based glues you know slip fits become like snug fits and this is like the inverse so this is gonna be especially helpful on the sliding dovetails I set those up to be fairly snug in the beginning and if that was glued in there with a water-based glue you would have like a few seconds to slap the glue on and slam that divider in before it swells and then you end up hammering the living daylight out of it to get it into the socket with the epoxy It'll be lubed up and it'll just slide right in like it's uh, like it's nothing, which is, uh, again, less stress <laughs> overall. Another kind of more traditional approach to a glue up like this would be to do it in sections. So you probably just glue up the four case corners and then you come back and you glue up the dividers later on. Uh, I kind of like being able to put the whole thing together all in one sitting or I guess all in one session just to make sure everything's going to come together perfectly and you know, it just kind of works out more perfectly, I guess. <laughs> or again, with, I guess, less stress and less uncertainty because the form that I leave it in, if I rack it in a square or I have all my dividers in the right spots or whatever, that's exactly the way it's going to cure. And because I have a fair amount of time invested in this already, I'm not super worried about, you know, having the case cured and ready to work again in like an hour. Overnight is uh, plenty fine for me. This is so much easier. <laughs> oh yeah. A little bit of lube makes everything better.
Now the last thing to do is just to make sure that the protrusion of these front dividers is exactly in the right spot. We want the bottom of this uh, rabbited area or this grooved area to be flush with the uh, front edge of the case. That looks pretty good. This one's got to go back. All right. I think that's it. About 45 minutes. Now, just a little bit of cleanup work here on this front face to get these dovetails flushed up to that front edge of the case. There. That's good enough for now. Still needs a little bit of cleanup work, but I'll address that later once we get these pieces in, which we're going to do next. So as a quick sanity check, I went ahead and made a little sample here just to uh, make sure this is all going to work out uh, as expected. So I have my beaded area here on the front edge. I have the miters cut on here, and then I've removed the majority of the material here, so I only have a mitered area there on the end. So this should slide in between the dividers and that mitered area should nest into that little pocket which I created earlier. Something like that. This is not super great. It needs a little more work, but that's a, uh, a sample. So at least as far as the proof of concept goes, this is good to go. So I'm gonna start making all of these and the first thing I'm gonna need for that is going to be all of the stock for all of these pieces. So I have an off cut, which is actually an off cut for making the dressing vanity, which is made from the same tree as uh, this piece is so kind of a nice way to reuse the material uh, so just quickly going to run a bead on there and then remove that thin section and just plane it down and clean it up until that bead uh, doesn't have any flat area on it and then that will be our starting stock for all of these things So now these are ready to be glued into the case. I sanded the bead here so it has a nice finish sanding on it. It's the same as the rest of the case, so I don't have to touch this ever again. And I'm going to apply the glue to the inside of the case because I don't want any squeeze out or anything between the case and the bead. If I put glue onto this piece and then slide it in, the glue is going to get uh, you know, rubbed up in here and get uh, you know, squeegeed <laughs> into this corner. So by putting it on the case, I don't have to really worry about that. It's another area where you don't need a ridiculous amount of glue. Less is more. Just a little, little bead here just to hold this thing in place. And we're going to slide this thing in. Just double check that it's in the right spot, the top and bottom. Couple clamps, and that's about it.
So with those installed, next I need a filler in here to bump out this area between the case and this uh, bead detail here. So I essentially need a filler that goes in here, something like that. Now I want to use a piece that is going to be oriented with the grain running top to bottom so it matches the side of the case so I can glue it to the side of the case without any issues. If I want to do a piece that runs front to back like this, I could attach it to just this runner, but it would be kind of floating up in here. Another option would be to do one of these, just glue it in the front here and have it float in the back, but I would prefer to have the whole thing secured to the case. So this will be a good opportunity to make use of some scraps. This is a piece from when Lindsay made her skateboard. This has got the grain running in the, uh, the correct direction for this. So I'm just gonna plan it down to thickness and then make my strips out of that. I don't need the entire drawer area to be fully you know, filled. I'll add a strip towards the top and towards the bottom and I'll have kind of an open area in the middle. I'm not too worried about that. I wanna have good uh, guidance for the drawer on the top and the bottom. So that is all the prep work on the case to get ready to receive the serpentine drawers, which we'll be making next time. So if you like a little more in-depth content like this, definitely check out my classes over in the guild. I have 150 videos spread out over nine classes over there that go into a lot of detail, just like this series. And this time I want to highlight my sofa table class. That one is a really great introduction to curved work. That table has a curve that carries through the entire front and sides of the case, including the drawer on the front. There's also some really good joinery lessons in there as well. Uh, several different kinds of Morrison tenon. You have a twin tenon, you have a breadboard end, and you have a crenellated tenon. And of course you have a small dovetail drawer which is a nice introduction to dovetails as well. And if you want to make your own serpentine chest of drawers, I do have a full set of plans available as well that you can check out over on my website. So that is going to do it for this one. Next time we're going to get into some wavy drawers <laughs> and some uh, goofy dovetails. So thank you as always for watching. I greatly appreciate it. If you have any questions or comments on the serpentine chest of drawers or anything here in the shop, please feel free to leave me a comment. As always, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. And until next time, <laughs> happy woodworking. <laughs>